Bitcoin is a net global neutral settlement asset for the internet, for the world, for transactions between real-time payment systems uh, is really the way it's going to happen. You've had more and more real-time payment systems emerge in very large regions. The question is, what is the global interoperability layer between all of these regional payment systems? Because they're not going to talk to one another. This is where I think Bitcoin shines and, and is the only way to actually provide global real-time 24-7 settlement of value on the internet. All right, guys, I've got David here with me. David, I thought a great place for us to start is you have this idea that the current system could actually be limiting our ability to grow GDP. What do you mean by that? I think it's even worse or better than that, uh, depending on how you look at the at, at the thing on, on the side of the opportunity or the problem. But uh, I actually think that GDP is constrained by the limitation of our archaic uh, payment rails and financial system. Um, and I think that you can unlock a lot of value for the world, for people, for global economy, if you remove all of the obstacles that stand in the way of money moving globally in the way that it should on the internet, like every other bit of data uh, out there. Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, I mean, when you think about it, Stripe in the early days, I think, had this mission of growing the the GDP of the Internet's GDP, um, which is, I think, a, a really good mission. But I think it's broader than that. I think the the you know global GDP uh, in the real world is constrained, and not only on the Internet. I feel like you know when you think about the time it takes for people to get paid. Um, you know, why do we need to get paid every two weeks? Why do creators on the long tail of platforms uh, get paid every six months. Um, you know, why, why don't, uh, drivers for Uber and everything else, uh, systematically get paid everywhere they are at the end of every ride. Uh, and you know, what, what are the downstream effects of money flowing on the internet? Like everything else, uh, when you get money much earlier and then you get to spend that money locally in your local economy uh, much sooner. I, I think there's just a lot there. And then capital and lending and all of that. So it's really interesting. Um, I, I've thought a lot about something that's tangentially related. So I may have some very nuanced questions just because uh, I don't have the answers, right? I, you, you think about these things and it's like, maybe this is possible. One of uh, the data points that's always stuck out in my mind is I think it's the top four banks make about $8 billion a year from overdraft fees. And so these are basically taking money from people who didn't have money at the time that the overdraft occurred. Uh, it seems like just paying employees at the end of every day could potentially solve some portion of that. One of the reasons why companies don't do it, I'm assuming, is because there's, uh, you know, revenue that could be generated by holding on to the capital for two weeks. Uh, but two is there's massive accounting issues, right, in terms of the complexity of doing this. How do you think about payment technology, but then also maybe the things that wrap around it, like accounting and, and kind of keeping track of totally. doing it in a different way? Yeah, you'll definitely need a lot of companies addressing real-time money flows um, and adapting their systems. I think that's, a, that's going to be an interesting investing category for a lot of uh, venture firms and a lot of entrepreneurs will have a lot of opportunities to go build these solutions out there to to meet that demand but the same is true i always like to go back to comparing things to the internet and the way that information moved the world had to adapt to real-time information we went from sending letters to each other and reading news every day delayed news the next day in the newspaper and now we have information flowing 24 7 in real time and the world adapted to that in so many different ways uh, and i think the same will be true for money when it moves the same way information moves on the internet now how much value do you think could be unlocked here right if we look at kind of global gdp are we talking about like a five to ten percent difference or are we talking like a doubling potentially of global gdp like how big is the opportunity uh if we were to get kind of real-time money flow well, I think that we need to the, we need to internalize several things. The the first thing is we need to internalize what the inefficiencies are uh, are constrain how much of the inefficiencies are constraining uh, in terms of GDP today with what's possible today. And you know, I think that this is already a pretty sizable uh, portion 
uh, of global payment volume. If you look at the correspondent banking network, I think it's about five to six trillion dollars a day of volume um, that moves not in real time, not Friday after 5 p.m. Uh, and you know sometimes takes days. It's really inefficient for people to to use it as a, a global settlement uh, payment network. Um, and that's five to six trillion dollars dollars a day. Uh, when you look at um, as a comparison again to to internet era stuff, uh, SMS messaging peaked at 20, 25 billion messages a day when it was over SMS. Uh, we're now in the in you know at least a good order of magnitude uh, on any given day. Uh, and the 20, 25 billion messages was probably New Year's Eve on telecommunications networks so so you know that's a an order of magnitude volume so you know can you actually get global money flows to be 50 trillion dollars a day maybe yeah if you unconstrain lower the cost make it 24 7 enable people to move money internationally for just one cent or five cent cost efficiently uh versus now a, a an international wire is 45 50 dollars uh, and so that constrains the amounts that are transacted and how it moves. It's not real time, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in terms of global payments volume, it could be 10x. And then the question is, how much net GDP uh, globally does that actually impact? That's a really hard question to answer because there are also secondary effects. So imagine if money travels globally uh, in real time at a fraction of the cost of current costs. And now uh, I'm a seller of any item or I'm a creator somewhere. I get paid at the end of every day. I spend that balance locally in my economy. Said person uh, has cash earlier, can probably have access to global capital much faster, much cheaper. Uh, and so the, the, the network effects, the downstream network effects of money moving in real time at a fraction of the cost, is is really hard to imagine, but I, I would assume it's going to have a, a very significant positive impact on global GDP. Now, when we think about uh, kind of the acceleration of money flows, it's very obvious to see the professional world, right? Businesses paying people, paying each other, that kind of accelerating and, and then being able to handle uh, various differences between currencies and exchange rates and kind of all the complexity that comes now with uh, cross-border type uh, transactions or payments. The retail or individual uh, that would go and start to do this, it seems like they may have a harder time, right? They don't have a finance department. They don't know exactly when they're actually, you know, kind of in the positive or it's a negative. Um, and so I think that there's an entire group of people who say, well, let's just go to a neutral currency, right? Let's use something like Bitcoin. It is truly global. There is no need for all of the uh, kind of currency exchanges, et cetera. How close are we to being able to do that versus it's more of first, let's get real-time payments and, and kind of unlock this GDP growth, and then we can move from the fiat currencies to uh, potentially something like Bitcoin? I think it's it's a really, it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and there are so many people in our circles who are fixated on that one thing of people are going to use bitcoin to buy their coffee um and i think in some regions where your your local currency is terrible or mismanaged massive inflation devaluation it might happen uh, but i think in economies that manage their currencies really well people will continue to transact in their home currencies for the foreseeable future the the value of bitcoin being such a neutral store of value and settlement asset is that it can be used to move value on the internet natively. And, and the, the only way that you do that with fiat currencies is with stable coins. And we can talk about that uh, in a bit as well. But I think that stable coins are good optimizations uh, for transactions that happen within the same currency. But if your entire network depends on one, uh, then that's a real problem. And I think it doesn't survive. And, you know, certainly I've experienced this firsthand. Um, and so Bitcoin is a net global neutral settlement asset for the internet, for the world, for transactions between real time payment systems uh, is really the way it's going to happen. Um, and there's an interesting development in the last five, 10 years 
you've had more and more real-time payment systems emerge in very large regions. So you have PIX in Brazil, you have UPI in India, you have real-time payments in Mexico, you have somewhat real-time payments in Europe. Uh, we'll eventually have FedNow become a thing in the US. And so if you have those real-time payment rails at the edges of the network, the question is, what is the global interoperability layer between all of these regional payment systems? Because they're not going to talk to one another. And no other country is going to accept anyone else's other, you know, another country's payment system. So this is where I think Bitcoin shines and and is the only way to actually provide global real-time 24-7 settlement of value on the internet. Now, you obviously led PayPal. Uh, you then went to Facebook um, and you not only did the messenger uh, kind of product and, and, and uh, did some amazing things there in terms of growing it and, and really building some Robux uh, functionality, but then also you did Libra. When you left Facebook, you pretty much could have gone and done almost anything in tech and business. There was tons of opportunity that you were given. Um, you chose to start a company called LightSpark. Talk a little bit as to why one, subject yourself to the pain and the glass eating of, of building a company from scratch, uh, but also two, kind of the idea and what got you energized about starting LightSpark? So I think I have determined that this was going to be the my life's mission to try to help bring to the world a, a, a real-time standard for open payments on the internet or standard for money on the internet and something that enables people, companies, entities to move value on the internet like everything else 24-7, uh, global, interoperable, cheap. Uh, and we tried a version of that with Libra uh, that then became DM, uh, but um, same thing. Um, and uh, and it failed because uh, it had this dependency on a centralized stablecoin. Uh, and, you know, algorithmic stablecoins won't work. And so you have to have a reserve. If you have to have a reserve, you have to have a centralized form of governance managing that reserve and that's a, a proverbial fat throat to choke and uh, when the main sponsor uh, is facebook and at the time wasn't the most popular company around that makes things 10 times more difficult so uh, i think that the lessons learned here was you need to really build this open neutral settlement network or asset uh, uh this, uh, this neutral settlement um asset and network on top of something that is really truly decentralized and truly neutral and and um, and that's why we're building on top of bitcoin and so when uh when i left i i had this super deep sense of unfinished business and i decided that this was going to be the thing i was going to try to do or die trying in the process and you know that's uh that's basically what lightspark does it builds on top of lightning um, because once you've decided that Bitcoin is that asset and is that network, you need to make it as efficient, real time, reliable as possible because layer one is expensive and slow, but very secure. And so lightning enables you to move Bitcoin in near real time at a fraction of the cost. And so what we've built is a series of capabilities and services that enable enterprises to use lightning in a very reliable, dependable way. Um, and then we're working on a number of other things to ensure that uh, uh, companies, exchanges, wallets, banks uh, can move value on top of uh, on top of Lightning, uh, whatever the currency is. Uh, and um, and I think that's where the impact will really start to reveal it reveal itself. Before we talk in more detail about the actual products you guys have built, uh, talk a little bit about Lightning. Uh, obviously, uh, I think Layer One being unscalable uh, became you know a topic of conversation. Uh, there was this proposal for the Lightning Network. Uh, it goes into beta, done pretty quickly, considering there wasn't kind of a you know a centralized effort and, and all of the things that make decentralization great. Um, I think that there is uh, some debate, right? Even within the Bitcoin community, some people say Lightning is amazing, and here's all the stats around the nodes and the and the transactions. Um, other people would say, "Hey, we thought it was going to be further along than it actually is." One of the things that makes it difficult is you can't actually see everything, and so you know there, there's some part of the network that's kind of hidden. But how do you evaluate you know the progress of Lightning, and, and what are the things that you're really excited about there that that give you confidence to go and build a company specifically on top of that technology? So. The reality is Lightning right now has made progress, uh, but it's still so incredibly early. 
Uh, and I think to your point, it's really hard to estimate the actual value of uh, transactions moving on top of Lightning. What you can see is the amount of Bitcoin that's locked on Lightning, but that is actually not a good representation of transaction volume because the liquidity moves around. Um, so it's that the same amount of Bitcoin can actually carry a lot more than the value um, that it represents because it can do round trips across channels carrying value around. Uh, and um, and so I think it's the 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 volume of transaction is growing, but it's still super, super early if you compare it to, to any mainstream payment network out there. Uh, and so there's a lot of work to be done. And I think the the reason why it hasn't had more adoption, is that a channel-based payment system, the way that it was designed is actually quite complex to scale and to use reliably. And so the the, the exchanges that are our clients um, have, for the most part, looked into implementing Lightning in the past. They started spending the cycles on trying to figure out how to implement it. They had a few engineers look at it, or some have even implemented it. And then they realized that, okay, now I need to have a full-time person, if not uh, several people rebalancing channels every day, trying to figure out how to open up new channels with new peers and new nodes that are going to be more conducive uh, for transactions um, and do all of this manually because there's just not great tooling out there. And, um, and so that's what we've built, uh, which is an enterprise grade experience uh, for companies to spin up a lightning node that they control that they have only they only they have control over the funds uh, uh, in that are locked in inside um and then predictably uh send and receive transactions uh on the network uh, with a lot of reliability and we built this thing called lightspark predict which um, actually has a, a real-time updated map of where the liquidity is on the network and how to route transactions in the most efficient possible way and deploy liquidity in real-time in channels to make those transactions successful. Uh, and that has been a game changer in terms of capital efficiency, uh, transaction success rates, uh, and uh, and then LightSpark Connect, which is the enterprise grade um, node management stuff that stuff and software that we have is actually doing uh, a marvels and keeping your node up and running uh, so you don't have to worry about it and so we we made using lightning a lot easier and um and that has resulted in in more adoption from exchanges and wallets that in turn are now building on, on the stack and i think the 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 analogy that i use a lot is early days of the internet if you wanted a web a web presence you had to get a server you had to rack the server you had to find the uh, routers configure the routers uh get an e1 or t1 line do all of that crazy stuff and nowadays you get a web server in minutes on aws and off you go uh, or any hosting service and um and i think that's a good analogy of how the web was able to develop because tools and services were put in place to reduce the friction and the cost of operating those services. Um, and that's what we've been doing at Lightspark for Lightning. Now, what are the types of companies that are interested in this today? Obviously, I think people jump to the finance sector and banks that, that are kind of dealing in payments every day are probably one. Um, what are you seeing there from those finance type customers? And then are there other industries where you're seeing a lot of interest? So banks, so we have bank customers, but outside of the US, because in the US, given the regulatory regime right now, um, banks cannot really touch Bitcoin at scale. Uh, so Bitcoin has the most regulatory clarity in the US compared to any other asset, because I think that's the only one that the SEC has declared is not a security. Um, so there's that. So institutional players can do Bitcoin 401ks. Um, they can do um, they can do all kinds of financial products. I think we'll have a Bitcoin ETF before the end of the year. Uh, so all of that is happening, but banks can still touch, cannot still touch uh, Bitcoin. So we have bank clients outside of the U.S., but not in the U.S. Uh, here in the U.S., it's mainly uh, exchanges, uh, wallet players that have the ability to move Bitcoin or or uh, custody Bitcoin, and uh, and those are our clients. And also, 
uh, a lot of market makers and, and liquidity providers uh, internationally that need to move Bitcoin uh, in a more efficient way. Now, when we start to look at some of these companies, how many of them have teams internally that are like actively working on this or, you know, even quote unquote Bitcoin teams? Uh, I think of it almost as like there's engineering teams, there's, you know, business teams. Uh, are they dedicating resources or is this kind of 5% of what the existing teams are doing and, and they're trying to kind of figure it out? And really a job you all have is you have to educate them on the importance of it and how to do it. And, and there's almost a technology component to your business, but there's also that education component that really helps to uh to, to kind of make the customer successful yeah i think that so th there are several parts to that education the first part is a, a lot of exchanges before looked at this and the uh, the equation didn't compute for them because the amount of effort and sustained effort to operationally be live uh in a reliable manner on lightning versus the perceived lack of activity on the network uh, just never resulted in them prioritizing the work of being on a lightning network. I think um, a, a lot of a lot of education work has to happen to understand that actually now that it's easier to be on the network, there's a flywheel effect of having the most efficient real-time payment network out there uh, available for them to build products and services on. And um, and so that's the first part of the educational journey. The second part is, OK, now, how do we build really great consumer experiences on top of this network that enable people to move value around the world in real time versus just faster Bitcoin deposits and withdrawals? And uh, and that's the second part of the the education journey and, and the time we spend with our clients, with our partners trying to paint a, a, a picture of the, the ginormous opportunity that we all have in front of us to go build on top of this network. Talk a little bit about the super apps, whether they are actual super apps internationally, or even we see, you know, Twitter now known as X trying to really integrate payments and they're getting some of the regulatory approvals and, and things like that. Is this every company eventually becomes a payments company is, is maybe like the trope that people will say online. And, and we're seeing that kind of play out here in the US for the first time. Or is this specifically because there's been some sort of technology unlock or, or they seeing something in the market that's forcing them to go do this? This episode is brought to you by Aradine. They're a brand new startup led by a number of Silicon Valley legends who just raised $81 million to build the future of internet infrastructure. You're probably wondering what that means. So let me explain. There are numerous new disruptive technologies that are being adopted simultaneously, from blockchain to artificial intelligence to zero-knowledge technologies. In order to ensure that these technologies thrive in this new world, we need new infrastructure, and that is where Aradine comes in. They just launched their first product line called Terraflux, which is a Bitcoin miner powered by the world's first 4 nanometer silicon chip technology. These air-cooled, single-phase and dual-phase immersion cooling miners have unrivaled speed and efficiency. They have superior uptime, and they leverage a brand new innovation called Energy Tune that allows miners to dynamically adjust the energy consumption and Bitcoin hash rate based on demand response needs of the electrical grids. Aradine is an ambitious company working on hard problems. I'm really impressed with them. And if you want to check out more, you can go to Aradine.com. That's A-U-R-A-D-I-N-E.com. Go check them out at Aradine.com today. I think that, um, I, and I think that for X, it's uh, it's maybe a little different. I think that um, that this is Elon wanting to build more financial services and payments experiences on top of this network that is already primed for that. But I think that ultimately, uh, the, the big problem right now is that all of these apps are not interoperable with one another. So if you are on Venmo, you can't send money to Cash App and vice versa. Uh, and uh, and I think that's that's constraining for the same reasons we talked about um, correspondent banking payments earlier and, and how much of the legacy rails was actually constraining uh, for economic uh, value to move around. And I think the same is true for these apps. They'll need to interoperate. And we believe certainly that uh, doing it through Bitcoin and through Lightning as a, an interoperable network is going to be the way it's going to happen. And, uh, and as you see more proliferation of payments experiences across all of these apps and across all of these surfaces, 
the ability to move liquidity around and send transactions across these apps is going to be really critical. And um, and and that's one of the the values of a network like Lightning that can do that, irrespective of the currency you're sending or irrespective of the app that you're using. And um, and and I'm a big believer that this is going to become a, a very major use case for this network. Obviously, we're seeing kind of this crypto winter, if you will. And so uh, there's a lot of people who either walk away from the industry, become less excited, and it has to do with the price of the assets normally. Um, but it seems like a lot of the legacy financial organizations, uh, a lot of the companies that are building in the space, they are kind of full steam ahead. How do you think of the difference between maybe the enthusiasm online or, or kind of price you know, action versus what's actually being built from an infrastructure and technology? standpoint well i believe that in those downturns or crypto winters if you will uh there are the best the, the best innovations are are created and um and and the reason for that is people focus on the right thing and i feel like in our industry in general a royal industry um there has been so much conversation around uh, asset appreciation, speculation, but so little conversation about how do you actually leverage that technology to build something that is going to solve a real world problem at scale. And there's a lot of work to do there. And um, and I think that during these times, you have the right people start to think about these problems rather than I'm going to list a token and then you know sell it to the public market. Um, and so this is really good for us because we're at a time where, first of all, we're building on top of Bitcoin, which is here to stay, is the only asset that can truly be a neutral settlement asset for the world. Uh, and uh, we're focused on solving real world problems, arguably one of the largest problems out there. Uh, and, um, and, and, and I think we have the right approach. And so we can attract really amazing people to work uh, at our company, which we have in the last year and a half. And um, and it's been really, really a, a perfect moment to build these types of solutions. I think a lot about some of the things you're talking about. And what they remind me of is kind of the invention of the iPhone and, and less because of the technology and kind of maybe the celebratory uh, nature that the iPhone is given. But if you think of Uber. Uber wasn't possible before the iPhone, where now two people, the rider and the driver, had GPS in the device and they could find each other kind of on the side of the road. And, you know, doing it somewhere in a rural area is one thing, doing it in the middle of an urban city is like a whole nother, uh, you know, kind of chaotic experience. But the technology was created, it became ubiquitous. And then we had this explosion of brand new applications and, and uh, companies. What are some of the things that if you are able to be successful that you all see as opportunities where other companies may be able to either leverage your, leverage your technology or be built kind of on top of it, right? If we get this real-time money movement, we get this explosion of GDP, wh where are the areas of opportunity for other entrepreneurs? So I'm thinking a lot uh, about um, AI agents and how AI agents pay one another, which seems a little uh out there but at the same time not so much when you think about where we're going i believe that you're you're going to have a bunch of ai agents that are going to perform certain tasks uh on our behalf and for instance you could have a travel um a, a travel agent that's a, basically an ai uh, system that enables you to book complex travel and it'll talk to other AI agents from the various providers out there. And how do you uh, move value natively in real time? It's kind of a, a bizarre thing if you think about it. If you're trying to book uh, something in a in a foreign country through an AI agent right now, you're like, oh, sorry, just complete this transaction on Monday because we're you know past uh, Friday 5 p.m. You can't do it right now. That that would kind of defeat the purpose of you having a an all encompassing 24 seven AI agent uh, able to do these things for you. Uh, there are also really interesting applications of how do you pay rights owners uh, for training your data? And is there a world where you can actually stream sats natively to uh, different rights owners as their data is used? Uh, the data that the AI, um, the LLM has been trained on 
is actually being consumed or used. Uh, there are lots of really interesting real-time global payments applications in this world that I think will be built by very, very good entrepreneurs out there. There are also all of the things that you highlighted around what are the things that need to adapt to a world where money moves 24-7 in real time globally, uh, accounting and reporting and taxes and all kinds of different things, tax software. Uh, all of these things are going to have to evolve. And I also think about the way that uh, you have an opportunity for global capital to be deployed. Um, it's kind of interesting that right now the the, the pools of liquidity for uh, lending uh, uh, and capital are very domestic still in nature, except if you're a global bank and you're actually uh, just taking deposits and not paying a lot of interest in one country and then lending that money uh, to another country uh citizens um that you're operating in at double digit uh percentage rates um and so all of that can be streamlined and people can uh, have access to cheaper capital globally uh, and there will be companies built on top of that that enable people to actually get their money around lock their uh money to get it repaid in real time uh and so there's all kinds of innovation around that um and and the list is long it's it's, it's literally a, a, a new internet of money uh and so what is the impact on the ability for people to innovate when they have an open network where they can move value natively on the internet i think it's like crazy amount of opportunity there one of the things you mentioned was this idea of streaming payments. And um, I invested in a company called Fountain. Basically, it's the value for value yep. model where you can kind of stream, you know, SaaS back and forth between the listener and the podcaster. And, and there was two components that uh, just, you know, kind of working with those guys that I found very interesting. So first they were like, oh, uh, the audience can stream sats to the podcaster and kind of pay them for the value they're receiving. My mind immediately went to like, well, the podcasters are going to stream money back to get people to listen, right? And so you kind of do get this like two-sided component where uh, um, having the ability to do real-time payments and, and very small uh, amounts makes sense. But then when you go and you look at it, in the United States, if someone gives you three cents or four cents, it doesn't really move the needle for most people. In other countries, you do that a couple of times, and now you start to look at like, well, actually, you can add up enough people listening to replace a day's wage or maybe a week. And sometimes even a couple hundred dollars could actually be the month's average wage for somebody in another country. And so how much of some of the real-time payments and streaming and, and things that we're talking about here do you think are centered on domestic United States versus actually maybe the adoption and, and really the value is seen much more uh, aggressively outside of the United States? I think uh, I think outside the United States is always more relevant because of several things, uh, and 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 one being what you're just talking about, and 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 also the fact that typically uh, for a lot of people in some of these markets, uh, having a global audience was not a thing until very recently, and getting monetized is uh, is harder. Uh, even if you look at the the long tail of creators on YouTube. Um, I believe that internationally, Google doesn't pay out directly to creators. And so you have to be affiliated with a third party that then pays you and you get paid very irregularly because like you accumulate maybe a hundred bucks over six months. Um, and so that's when you get paid instead of getting paid at, at, at literally at the end of every video view or while the video view is actually happening. Um, and so I think there's a lot of value to be unlocked with streaming money and streaming uh, wages uh, as you perform the thing that you're earning the wage for. Uh, and um, and having technology that enables that at scale with any currency, by the way, is really going to be the key. And, and the network that will transport that value natively on the Internet is going to be Bitcoin with Lightning. Now, when you go and you look at the risks or the biggest reasons that something like this could fail, what, what are the areas that kind of keep you up at night or, or you you know spend a lot of time saying, hey, we've identified the risk and now we've got to go kill it or, or mitigate it? Well, first of all, uh, the tech is hard. So, uh, I mean, you and I have done a bunch of things that other companies uh, that are using more centralized technologies that are hard to do. Uh, this is significantly harder and um and the reason it's hard is because it's decentralized because it's a 
complicated protocol to really scale to have the reliability and and um and 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 the user experience the the resulting user experience that people have come to expect from a modern payment network uh it's really hard it's a lot of hard work from a technology standpoint uh so there's that part and then there's actually the part of okay now everyone needs to go build a really compelling consumer experience on top of this technology and for for our part we are not touching consumers we're at the core of the network providing interfaces and capabilities and sdks for companies to go build these experiences and so we have to try to get a lot of players out there to create really compelling consumer experiences and business experiences to showcase what the technology can do and we're not there yet so you know fountain is an example of something that has uh relative product market fit but shows traction of streaming money to people uh but what is what what are the the 10 other use cases that are mainstream that are going to really inspire other companies to jump on the bandwagon and build on top of it so there it's like network effect on top of network effect on top of network effect that we don't control directly and i think that's the hardest part of the edu the education and the execution um of our company is really trying to to light up the path to enable those experiences to become mainstream when you see some of the people who are coming into this space it feels like we now have gone from uh what i'll call the early adopters and, and usually younger people who you know they're kind of either coming out of school or they're tinkering with this stuff on on the weekends now we're getting some very very big name executives people who have built large companies in the past and, and it feels like maybe the entrepreneurial energy is maturing a little bit does that have like a kind of profound impact or how do you think about that and, and i'd put you in that category of you know it, it's one thing when somebody says hey i'm gonna go build this company it's another thing when the, the guy who says hey i was the president of paypal right and, and worked on messenger and helped build libra and you say you're gonna go build it um maybe you don't feel like that gives you an advantage but i think to other people they say oh this is a data point that the industry is maturing and, and so how do you think as being part of that um you know the pros and cons of, of these people coming in i think it's only pros i feel like just getting um the compounding effects of more talent pouring in to focus on the right things which are you know which is building technology and products that solve real world problems using the technology um i think is going to have profound impacts because you will have successes and success begets success you'll have more entrepreneurs just coming and building and 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 solving real world problems on the technology so i'm actually really bullish about what's going to happen in the next decade on the on the network and and the amount of innovation and successful companies that will be built uh it's um it's really a a a, a very exciting time actually I, I think there's just more energy uh, you see what Block is doing as a public company, investing in core technologies around Bitcoin and around solving uh, problems for developers and others on the network. Uh, all of these things are really encouraging to me. You see PayPal uh, doing uh, more things on uh, crypto, and you know they they definitely have you know, issued a, a stablecoin, but they're doing Bitcoin um, withdrawals now for the first time on top of PayPal and Venmo. Uh, which might pave the way for interoperability with other assets and and other networks um, and other wallets. Uh, so I think uh, I think there's just a lot of 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 energy that will compound to a really good place. The last two things I want to talk about are stable coins and regulation. Um, on the regulatory front, you mentioned earlier, obviously, the United States is probably the most onerous when it comes to what people are able to do currently. How do you see that changing over time? And, and what are maybe one or two things that you specifically think, if these change, it would be a big unlock for the industry? Well, first, I think we're in a very sad state of things, um, when, especially when you look at this through the prism of what's happening internationally. You see singapore hong kong the uk france for europe a number of other countries that are fighting to attract the most innovative talent to come and build on top of these technologies and we're chasing people away 
uh and uh and i think it's uh it's sad it's um it's really sad to see all this talent leaving the country to go build somewhere else because we don't have the regulatory clarity that is required to go build here uh and uh, and the climate is generally very anti tech not only anti crypto right now um and you know more specifically anti crypto for sure and i think for stable coins it's an interesting time uh, I think stable coins are useful. I think they're here to stay. I think they solve real world problems around uh, what is the digital version of your home currency that you can move on networks in a more efficient way. Um, I actually think that uh, uh, stable coins on top of Lightning will be a thing as a measure of, again, optimization, not something that you solely depend on. Uh, but it's unclear where this is going. There's a lot of animosity uh around uh private companies uh issuing a unit of accounts that represents your home currency for governments and governments are very concerned about that and certainly we experienced that firsthand as a as a major irritant of saying okay now we're going to move the trust uh from the government to a private company that has to manage a, a reserve a, in the right way i think good regulation could help address that uh and uh, and good regulation around what is uh, a, a stable coin how is it managed what are the consumer protection what are the the reserve uh, the acceptable reserve uh, provisions in terms of management of of said reserve etc I, I i think there's a lot of that that we we worked a lot on on that in the libra days to try to build or help define uh, a framework for it um but right now we're we're nowhere near this i think there's a, a bill in the house that is uh being uh being uh, uh you know pushed uh but it's unclear whether it's going to pass or not and so there's a lot of uncertainty when you see the stable coins, uh, one of the data points that keeps coming up over and over and over again in recent weeks is stable coins now uh, reportedly do as much transaction volume as Visa. Uh, Bitcoin does a very impressive amount. Um, really, people, I think, are measuring kind of layer one Bitcoin transactions. They don't really account for layer two. And so it's unclear what the total Bitcoin uh, transaction volume is. But it seems like people are definitely using the stable coins for these transactions. And so they're getting the benefit of some of the technology, but still using the fiat currency. How do we transition between those two? Is it something where they both kind of win and like all boats rise together? Do you think that we will go kind of fiat non, you know, blockchain, you go fiat blockchain, and then eventually uh -huh. people start to use Bitcoin or, or what does that look like? So first I think those are, apple and oranges comparisons that people are making um a lot of the transaction volume on on stable coins um is still trading volume when you're buying and selling into assets and those are for each, every time you buy and sell an asset on any exchange or a dex or that's a transaction um and i personally don't consider that to be payments i think it's a form of uh, asset transfer uh, but I think there are good use cases of stable coins being used for payments um, and a lot outside of the United States when uh, people would rather hold dollars than um, than anything else. And they have a digital form of dollars that they can use. And certainly you can see that with uh, in some countries with USDC and and even a, a larger scale with Tether uh, that is being used in Latin America and Africa and all kinds of other countries to have a stable um, store value and, and a way to move value around uh, digitally at at, at, a, at a fraction of the cost of uh, of everything else. Um, so there's definitely a lot of value um, in stable coins. And I think the, the way that I see the future is that Bitcoin and Lightning is the net neutral uh, settlement network between all payment systems and all networks that don't talk to each other. Uh, it's the global fabric that brings all of these networks together, and enable people to move value natively on the internet. And in some cases, you'll just transact natively in Bitcoin. In some cases, you'll convert at the edges from one currency to another. And from a consumer standpoint, they won't even know. It's like, you know, when you send an email, you don't think about SMTP. Uh, when you'll send money, you won't think about Bitcoin and Lightning. You'll send your home currency. The person on the other side will receive their home currency. It'll be completely behind the scenes. Um, and then in some cases, 
you will have stable coins on top of Lightning uh, because you're transacting in the same currency um, and you want the most efficient way to move value around. And uh, and in some cases, it might even be CBDC, who knows? But uh, but making Lightning compatible with other assets is a key thing that many of us are working on. And uh, and I think that it's going to be an optimization and that stable coins will be useful in that context. My last question for you is uh, you seem to be having a lot of fun doing this. And so what is the most rewarding part of working on LightSpark? Well, it's, uh, it's really working with all of the amazing people that are right outside this door uh, right now because I'm old fashioned and I like working in an office with uh, with talented people. And uh, and so the, the the vast majority of the team is here in the office. And uh, and so it's working with amazingly talented people on uh, on a problem that is so motivating and inspiring to go solve because it hasn't been done before and and money still moves like it moved in the 60s and 70s when you think about global money movements and same networks and same technology um and so going and addressing that and unlocking you know that gdp for the world uh that is constrained by antiquated rails uh and uh, empowering people to move money on the internet the way that they move anything else on the internet is such an, an, an energizing uh, and fulfilling mission for all of us and getting to work with uh, my team here uh, on this problem day in and day out is is amazing. And it's a small team, so it's great. It's uh, after, after having um, been at companies that are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, being in a small company uh, is uh, is amazing. I love that. Where can we send people to find more about LightSpark? LightSpark.com. Awesome. David, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I always enjoy talking to you. And uh, Same here. I'm cheering for you. I think that uh, what you guys are doing for the adoption of Bitcoin uh, is incredibly important. So uh, wishing you all the success and we'll definitely do it again in the future. Thank you. Great to see you.